Imagine you're a fish. Life's simple. You're swimming around, eating plankton, living your best aquatic life. Then, bam, this parasitic isopod rolls up like it owns the place. It latches onto your tongue and starts sucking blood like it's a drunk mosquito at an all-you-can-drink buffet. It doesn't just suck blood for funsies. It keeps going until your tongue straight up withers away and dies. Yeah, R.I.P. Fish Tongue. You had one job and now you're gone. But is the louse done yet? Of course not. Nature loves a good sequel. Hey, uh, Tongue? You okay? You're looking kind of shriveled there, bud. Yeah, about that. I'm not your tongue anymore, dude. I'm out. Peace. Wait, what? You can't just... What am I supposed to do now? Yo, what's up, champ? Don't sweat it. I'm your new tongue now. What the... No, absolutely not. Get out of here, man. Relax, my guy. I'll handle the chewing, the swallowing, everything. You won't even notice I'm here. Well, except for the whole blood-sucking thing, but that's minor. Minor? You're eating all my food. Can't I just get, like, one plankton for myself? Bro, it's a team effort. You swim, I chew. Think of me as your upgrade. Upgrade? I didn't ask for this. This is the worst day ever. This isopod, now chilling in your mouth rent-free, becomes your new tongue. I'm not kidding. It just plops itself down in the spot where your old tongue used to be, like, don't worry, I got this, buddy. And here's the wildest part. The fish just has to deal with it. No complaints, no refunds. That's your new tongue now, pal. This fake tongue isn't exactly a selfless hero. While it technically helps the fish eat and function, it's not doing it for free. Every time the fish eats, the louse helps itself to the first bite. Imagine sharing every meal you eat with a rude little roommate that is your tongue. This tongue-snatching louse is out here living the dream. Free meals, no bills, and a cozy spot inside someone else's face. Meanwhile, you? You are just out here being the victim of the most messed up parasitic relationship ever. Cordyceps fungi don't just casually invade an insect's body like some polite parasite. No, they go straight for the brain, hijacking their host. It all starts innocently enough. A tiny spore from the cordyceps fungus lands on an insect. Ants are their usual victims, but they've also got a thing for caterpillars, spiders, and even grasshoppers. The spore works its way through the insect's exoskeleton. The fungus grows inside the insect's body, spreading filaments called mycelium. Think creepy little fungal roots through its tissues. Cordyceps releases chemicals that mess with the insect's central nervous system, essentially turning it into a zombie. The insect is still alive, but no longer in control. It's like someone pressed the autopilot button on their brain. And what's the first thing this zombie bug does? It climbs. The fungus forces the insect to crawl to a high spot, like the tip of a branch or the top of a blade of grass. Why? Because cordyceps is all about that sweet, sweet spore dispersal. Getting high, literally, means those spores can spread farther and infect even more poor bugs. Once the insect is in position, cordyceps goes full supervillain. The fungus starts growing out of the bug's body, usually through its head. It's like a horrifying fungal unicorn. The stalk-like structure, called the fruiting body, eventually bursts open, releasing spores into the wind to continue this whole nightmare cycle. There are over 600 species of cordyceps, and each one is usually super picky about which insect it zombifies. It's like they've got Tinder profiles for their favorite bug types. While insects are their main victims, scientists are keeping an eye on whether they could ever make the jump to humans. Spoiler, probably not. Our immune systems are way too complicated. But still, maybe don't breathe in random forest spores, okay? Maybe The Last of Us isn't just a story, it's a preview. The emerald cockroach wasp doesn't just go for a casual sting, it zeroes in on a cockroach, and instead of killing it outright like a normal predator, it injects venom directly into its brain. Into its brain. This venom is basically a zombie serum. It doesn't kill the roach, but it makes it super chill. Like, oh yeah, drag me wherever you want. I'm just vibing here levels of chill. And that's exactly what the wasp does. It grabs the cockroach by the antenna like it's a leash and takes it on a little field trip back to its burrow. Once they're in the wasp's creepy little underground lair, mama wasp lays her eggs on the cockroach. And while the roach is just sitting there, alive and completely powerless, 
those eggs hatch into baby wasps and start eating it. And they're polite enough to eat the least vital organs first, so the roach stays alive as long as possible. By the time the wasp larvae are ready to leave, the cockroach is basically an empty shell, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. The red-backed spider, aka the ultimate femme fatale of the animal kingdom. These ladies put the you can look but don't touch to shame, because if you do touch, well, you're about to become dessert. A male red-backed spider sees a fine-looking female chilling in her web, and even though she's about three times his size and has the personality of a Bond villain, he's like, yeah, I could make this work. He carefully tiptoes into her web like some lovesick Romeo sneaking into Juliet's balcony. Uh, hey there, sweet silk spinner. You, uh, come here often? Seriously? That's your opener? Bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off. No, but for real. Those legs? Wow. Eight of them? Perfect symmetry? Top-notch predator vibes? I like that in a lady. <sighs> You're embarrassing yourself, little man. But I'm bored, so proceed, if you must. R really Sweet. Okay, so... Uh, I was thinking we could... Look, you've got about 30 seconds to impress me. After that, you're either gone or dinner. So, what's it gonna be? Uh, consider me your willing sacrifice. Eh, fine. Let's get this over with. The two do the deed, and as soon as the mood shifts, the male voluntarily flips himself onto her fangs, and she's all, Eh, I've had better, but protein's protein. This isn't some accident or a random bad breakup moment. The dude knows what's coming. Redback males willingly sacrifice themselves for the ladies, probably thinking, well, at least my DNA will live on. Why does she do it? Turns out, redback ladies are all about efficiency. Mating takes energy. And what's a better post-mating snack than the guy who made it all happen? In the end, the female is stronger, her eggs are nourished, and the male, well, he's just gone. Leucochloridium parasitic worm. First, they find a snail minding its own business, living that slimy, peaceful life. But peace isn't on the menu today. The worm invades the snail's body like some alien. And then it does something truly insane. It moves into the snail's eye stalks. Yeah, the actual eyeballs. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, that's gross, but manageable, right? Wrong. Once inside the eye stalks, these worms go full-on disco mode. They make the eye stalks swell up, pulsate, and turn into bright, colorful, wormy strobe lights. Imagine you're just a snail, trying to live your best life, and suddenly your eyes are literally turned into a pair of living glow sticks, like in a cold play concert. And why does the worm do this? To attract predators, specifically birds. See, birds see those pulsating eye stalks and think, oh sweet, snail snacks. So they swoop in and gobble up the snail, which is exactly what the parasitic worm wanted. Because once it's inside the bird's gut, it can reproduce and start the whole nightmare cycle all over again. Epimus beetle larva. Think of it as the ultimate reverse Uno card of the animal kingdom. You see, these tiny little jerks don't just survive the food chain, they flip it, light it on fire, and laugh about it later. Frogs and toads see these larvae chilling on a leaf, looking all innocent and snack-sized, and if you're an amphibian, tiny, wiggly thing is basically fine dining. So the frog's like, ooh, free buffet. And snaps the larva up in one big gulp. Big mistake, huge. The second that larva gets swallowed, it's like, oh, you thought this was over? Sweetheart, it's just getting started. Instead of going quietly into the digestive system, this bad boy whips out its metaphorical nunchucks and starts throwing hands, or, you know, mandibles. It claws its way out of the amphibian's stomach, and just when the frog thinks, oh good, it's gone, the larva comes back for round two, and this is where it goes from bad to straight-up nightmare fuel. The larva doesn't just escape, it turns the tables. It starts eating the frog or toad from the outside alive, alive. The predator becomes the prey in the most humiliating way possible. By the time the larva is done, there's no frog, just a very smug beetle larva with a full belly and zero regrets. Unlike regular ants, who just invade picnic baskets or enslave other species like overachieving jerks, Dracula ants keep the nightmare in-house. They don't torment their enemies. They go after their own family. 
These ants live in colonies like all the other happy little ants you've seen on National Geographic. But instead of acting like a supportive community, the adult Dracula ants decide it's feeding time and, oh look, the baby larvae are right there. And what do they do? They pierce their own kids to drink their hemolymph. That's bug blood, by the way. Yeah, these ants are like, hey, Junior, you're looking plump today. Mind if I poke you real quick? And the worst part? The larvae don't even die from this. No, they just sit there like tiny little Capri Suns, getting tapped again and again for their vital juices. Scientists think this evolved as some messed up way for the colony to share nutrients without having to kill off the future workforce. So, the larvae survive to become adults, and then they get to do the same thing to their babies. The circle of life, ain't it grand? Lacewing larvae are tiny, barely bigger than a freckle, but don't let their size fool you. They're straight up savages. They hunt down their prey, no, 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 usually aphids or other small bugs, and instead of just munching and moving on, they glue the leftover corpses onto their backs like some kind of goth DIY project. Timmy the bug is out there minding his own business when bam, some bug chomps him to death. Then as his life flashes before his eyes, the last thing he sees is his murderer casually strapping his body onto its back like a trophy. It's like if a serial killer walked into a hardware store and said, do you have any glue strong enough to hold a body count? And why do they do this? Camouflage, of course. To predators, the lacewing larvae just look like a pile of debris. It's like one kid in class in high school who always had crumbs all over them to make it even creepier. The corpses they pile on aren't random. No, these little psychos pick and choose, arranging them to maximize their nobody-will-mess-with-me energy 